Welcome back to this episode of the Deeper Podcast. Um, in true Deeper Podcast form, uh, even after promising that he would be here last week, Jeremy Wynn is not here, and I am filling in for him as the host, and my co-hosts, Amy and my wife, Lee. Welcome to the podcast. Say something. Thank you. Something. Absolutely <laughs> killed it. Good job. Okay, these are both regulars, so they don't really need a lot of introduction. Um, our quick question of the day today. Is kind of geared towards Lee here because oh, uh, I found out recently, just a couple of weeks ago, that the burger stand, mm. one of the better burger places in Topeka, very sadly, is mm, closing. And mm. I think it's like in the next two or three days. I think it's this weekend. Mm. I know we haven't gone yet. Um, so, just que- your question is what it, when burger stand leaves? What's the best what's backup the burger? What's the best burger in Topeka? Mm. Or if you have a story that you'd like to share about, a burger experience in general. I'm all ears. Here's the thing is I'm going to want to hear like everyone else's answer, mm. you know? And great if mm. anyone wants to text me the best burger in Topeka. <laughs> I don't know if we've, we have an email that we're setting up to uh, kind of take people's questions. Oh, and so this would be a good one to be like, hey, send in your own thoughts. It's I'm very, you know, biblically uh, yeah, sound rude. question. This is the important stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think? Do you, want me to, do you want me to stall and start by well, telling no, you my story? Well, no, I'm just thinking, okay. like, I don't know that there's anywhere I would have gone to get a burger besides Burger Stand. So I'm almost like, then let's just go grill it on the Barbie. You know, oh, I, want, yeah. okay. I, I do love just like a real good John burger. John Vogel. On John Vogel the makes grilled. really good grilled burgers. Wow. Brittany great thinks he should out. open a restaurant. Really? So I think maybe it will just, if people could start okay. well, putting that up in at his house. ear. If we're going to say that, idea. like, yeah. if we're going to say that, like, you can do it better than a lot of places yourself, where are you getting that? Like, are you getting a pre put together ground beef patty you there are you just like yeah. buying the ground beef and forming it yourself mm-hmm. oh my goodness and a higher quality yeah. like yeah quality I mean, basically quality? like 99 percent. what about yeah, like 80 yeah. 20 though with all that fat Listen, so and it would good. make for more juicy yep. but like yep. just not as good and in reality it would yep. shrink it down would shrink down yeah. a lot that's so, true yeah. that's true what do you think babe well, if I'm going like a fast food burger, I really don't, I, I don't know, I'm kind of picky with burgers. I really like, I really like cheeseburgers. Uh, but Five Guys Five probably guys, is, right? yeah, up yep. there. Yeah. Otherwise, like people have said that, um, what, Johnny's Tavern and Blue Moose mm-hmm. and Pennant all have really good burgers. Some of those sit down, nicer and places or whatever. And I think that I've had burgers at all those places, but none of them, I can't like remember the burger experience. Johnny's yeah. is really so, like more of a smash burger, really thin. Okay. thin. You know what? There is Circle mm-hmm. has this new like smash burger on Thursday restaurant nights, on Thursday Saturday, night. Yep. Um, Thursday Club or something, yeah, I think it's called. Club. And I heard those were really good. Nice. I, don't, I haven't had them yet. Smash Burger. I feel like Topeka is full of Smash Burger fans yeah, now between be like true. a Culver's and a Freddy's and a. Did you have places. a story you were going to share about a well, burger? Yeah, I, in case you guys needed to think for a while, I was going to share my Austin story. So oh. this is when I think about ordering a burger somewhere, this is a story I think of. We, Austin, Texas, where we live for a while, you know, is pretty granola. Right. So we went to a, a friend's birthday at a nice restaurant oh, and got there <laughs> and opened the menu. And um, I saw what looked to be an incredible burger invention on the menu. It was mm-hmm. called the black bean. This burger. was early in our Austin days. Yeah, we Doug, didn't. Yeah. Doug wasn't super educated in no, the ways of. No, I was not. In the ways of the granola. The foodie. <laughs> so I thought, and I read it, and there was avocado and cheese and stuff. And I was like, this is a taco on top of a burger. Yeah. which is two of my favorite foods combined. So I got yeah. very excited. I was, it has black beans I on it. I ordered it. it my friends kind of looked at me weird, but didn't say anything. <laughs> and I was very, honestly, very excited. And it came out and I looked at it and thought, that looks like a hockey puck. That looks, but I'm going to try it. And I tried it and it was pure chalk. And I like spit it out of my mouth. For those of you that don't know what a black bean burger is, <laughs> it is like a meat substitute burger so there was no meat it's like a it's a vegetarian vegetarian option and i am not a vegetarian person and so i had a really bad experience i almost cried in that moment knowing how (laughs) we didn't have a lot of money knowing how much i just paid for a black bean burger i was like you've got to be kidding me one of our friends of this switched with you like have went halvesies with a real burger right yes thank goodness matt balthazar thank you provided a lot of um, you know it's laughter you talk about the burger stand I really like their black bean burger. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. You choose to get it at some point. I have, okay. Yeah. Wow. 
That's Proud good. of you. Good job. Okay. Well, <laughs> uh, that's a RIP to Burger Stand in Topeka. We are sad mm-hmm. you're leaving. Um, I guess we'll take our business to Five Guys and or home Do to the barbecue. Like, uh, Red Robin? Man, mm. We haven't been to Red Robin in mm. a long time. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah. Pretty, pretty good. That's, that's your, kinda, that would be No, yours? I mean, no, like I said, I would okay. probably just... Okay. Grill one. Just <laughs> okay. Well, we are in week three of our minor prophet series, which we call the Way Back to God. Normally, I would send it over to the person who's preaching to tell us about <laughs> the sermon, but that is me this week. So, uh, to give you a quick overview of Amos and what we'll be talking about, Amos was uh, relatively unique in that he was a shepherd who got called to be a prophet. He lived in Judah, but got called to prophesy in Israel. And so the book is really about God, God's warnings to Israel that he's going to bring judgment upon them. And specifically in Amos, it's about um, how people are treating the poor and the disenfranchised. So there are a number of passages in Amos that are just really hard, but it's about um, people who are wealthy already getting wealthier off of the backs of poor people who are, um, it says, kind of... A, ignoring the needy in, in the gate is what it's called, but like in the town square, they're kind of like, you know, just looking away from them and ignoring them or taking advantage of them. And so God really says, um, oh, oh, the other thing to mention is uh, this is a rare book that was written kind of in a time of prosperity. So like Israel was doing good. Um, Assyria that was going to raise up again and destroy them in a little bit. They had kind of had to take a, they had to take a step back away from the global stage. Like Israel was given room to, to really grow. And so they, they grew in boundaries and wealth and all that stuff. So this is written to them. And God basically says, like, I am disgusted with the way that you're living. I don't want your worship because it is not out of a pure heart. And I'm going to bring judgment, bring judgment to you soon. And so um, the way back that we talk about in our sermon is really a mixture of like seeking the Lord and then pursuing justice because there's so much injustice. And that's also a theme of a lot of the minor prophets, right? Mm-hmm. Social, biblical justice. So one of the, one of the first points we talk about and something that, um, I think stood out to me because it resonated with my own story, spiritual story with the Lord is that when we experience prosperity and success, when things are going good in our lives, we tend to forget God or neglect him. And so curious if that's true for you two. I know that you're both holier and better than I am, (laughs) but how in your own lives, maybe have you seen that play out where things are going good and you kind of drift a little bit from the Lord because of it? Well, even as doing the sermon run through and just thinking through this, I was like, man, this goes right back to the seven churches in Laodicea mm-hmm. yeah. where mm-hmm. they did not need God. Like mm-hmm. they thought we have everything. We're yeah. good. Mm-hmm. So I don't need God. And so um, that's where I was kind of thinking, like where are those areas even in my life where I'm like, things are going well. Mm. I'll bring you in God where I don't. When I need you. Kind when of I need you or I don't have answers or whatever. But like when things are status quo or going well, mm-hmm. like yeah. We're, yeah. we're just moving. Yeah, And so um, when I was thinking about that, I was thinking about even in my time as a teacher or even in um, my first six years working here at the church, really pretty easy. Mm-hmm. Like, of course, I would ask God to bless things and I would bring him a part of it. But like an, I really could do out of my own effort. And mm-hmm. it was pretty easy. Like somebody new walks in, getting them plugged in or meeting with leaders or students or doing different things. Mm. And. I am realizing like I'm just in a season where I can't do ministry without constantly being like, okay, Lord, help guide me here. Mm. Give me direction. Give me discernment. Mm. Like I, like I can't do for myself. And so he has just put me in a place where I'm having to be like, Mm. oh, wow. I realize how much I do out of like cruise control or Mm. when you taught for 17 years, it was so easy just to kind of like memorize like how to do things and you just go and it's easy. But like, this is the first time really I've been in a role where I'm like mm-hmm. so dependent on him because I'm like, I don't have the answers, but you do. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's a I great realize example. how often just because of mm-hmm. it's easy and I've been doing the same thing mm-hmm. just to go along with life mm-hmm. without needing him to help. Like I want him to be a part of it, yeah. but I don't really yeah, yeah. need him. You're not like relying on yeah. him to get through the day. Yeah. yeah. 
that's a great example. Just yeah. being in a job for so long and doing it so well that you're like, like, yeah, you've got yeah, it. I, it's, I'm in control. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got it mm -hmm. under control. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned in your sermon, um, living in Austin and just living, um, like working and ministering among um, people who are so, so wealthy. And I think during, during that season of life, um, and now too, it's, it's easy to go, oh, because I don't have as much as them, um, I am not one of, mm. I, like, I'm not living in comfort and prosperity because I don't have all the things that they have. Mm. Um, but forgetting that, like, we're in the top 1% of the world in our actual, like, luxury and comfort and prosperity. And um, where am I going with this? So, uh, so. I'm thinking of a friend, a dear, dear friend who um, was among those people um, who just made crazy amounts of money um, in Austin and, and have beautiful homes, multiple homes and uh, amazing vacations and everything they could want or need. And the last couple of years, um, their finances have like dropped to the point where um, there is no, there is nothing incoming and hasn't been for quite a while. And, um, they're, they're looking at some rough financial times, um, and maybe are going to have to sell their house and really are. Anyway, I'm talking to my dear friend about this and she just says, you know, I am so thankful, mm -hmm. um, because being in this position, like has has put me in a place of dependence on the Lord that mm. I, I really haven't had to be in. Um, and that feels like a gift mm. to just have like my, my focus shift to go. I look to the Lord as my provider. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just thought that was such a, a mm. beautiful picture and a reminder to me, um, of, of being in that place continually because we're always dependent on the Lord. But like you said, it's easy to forget. I don't know that I answered your question. Yeah, so, sure. For sure. And I, my clearest example that I thought of in my head was also a work-related one. So now I'm just seeing this a little bit of a theme. And maybe it's because we have never, um, you know, I don't know that I'm speaking for everybody in our listening audience, but we have never struggled with the desperation of like not knowing where the next meal is coming mm -hmm. from or being homeless and on the street and not mm -hmm. having a house. But our desperation um, can be associated a lot with like our, what we do every day, our job. So mm -hmm. whether it's being a, a mother or a father, or whether it is my example is feeling like after a certain amount of student ministry, I could do it on my own, which is so scary in <laughs> ministry. Mm -hmm. When you get to the point of like, yeah, I don't really need to depend on God. Mm -hmm. I can do this out of my own strength. Mm -hmm. And then God, um, and that's kind of a segue, God using a really rough situation at work to remind me like, no, you can't. Like, you're crazy to go down this road and think that you could do this without me. Here's here's a reminder that you have to depend on me every day and I'm the one doing the work, mm -hmm. not you. Mm -hmm. And so it took a rough situation at work to bring me back right to God. Cause I, I do, I think of it as a almost imperceptible daily drift if you're just working out of your own. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this is interesting. It was interesting to me in Amos because, and I'll tell, I'll tell a little backstory to this too, but like, uh, Amos gives these examples. God gives these examples to Israel of how he's tried to bring them back. Right. So he sent a, a famine and he sent a drought and he sent pestilence and disease. And he says, I've sent all these things to you in a sense to bring you back for you to wake up to the fact that you're drifting away from me, but you, you did not return. You have not returned to me. And I mean, it is my belief that not only God did not only do that in the Old Testament, but that he continues to do that to us when we drift. Now, I remember I was at a youth, a student conference, large student conference, a, a well-known speaker and author came and stood on stage and said, God never brings bad things mm. into your life. Mm. But when bad things happen, he will redeem them for good. And I remember being like, what is this guy talking about? Has he not read scripture? the Bible, the, Bible, <laughs> <Yeah>. the <laughs> Old Testament? So I remember me and my um, coworker at that time requested to sit down with this guy uh, in the middle of the next day and just brought our concerns to him. We're like, hey, I, I don't think that this is scripturally true. 
And it was heartbreaking to have like a 15 minute conversation where he largely dismissed us Mm -hmm. and like dismissed the seminary I went to and all this stuff because his, you know, fervent belief is that God would never do that to us. Mm -hmm. But it seems like this is exactly the kind of thing that God does to Mm -hmm. win us back, to bring us back to him. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'm curious when you guys have felt adrift, when you've felt a lack or independence or a lack of dependence on God, what are some things that maybe he's used in your life to bring you back to him? What's that look like? Well, I want to point to, to the fact that Amos was a shepherd and then talks about God using these hard things to, to bring them back because you think about sheep Mm. and if they start to wander, Mm. um, they, they maybe don't realize that how far they've wandered, right? They don't realize like, Oh, I'm, separated from the flock until they're hungry and they don't have food or if a thief is coming or there's a lion (laughs) or something happens that makes that sheep realize where, where's my shepherd? Like Mm -hmm. I'm not safe. I need to get back to him. Mm -hmm. And, and it just makes so much sense that like it's facing those experiences and those experiences happen more when we drift from our shepherd, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're not under his protection. So it's a both and that God brings those things to bring us back to him. And also um, when we're near God, those things look different when they happen because we haven't wondered, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Because we're leaning on him. So Amy, do you have a thought? I haven't actually thought about my example More of personal, that. But that was a perfect segue because, I, I mean, I can look throughout my walk with Jesus in times in college, times in high school, in my early 20s or 30s where God has used different scenarios to just be like, hey, are you going on cruise control? Are you trying to do this without my help? Mm-hmm. And he has done different things. But, um, I, I mean, I feel like besides the job switch, I feel like um, – losing my dad. Mm. And at that same time, there were some other factors that there were just a lot of moments where Mm. I realized how much I was dependent on my physical earthly father of bailing me out of things. Mm. And Mm. God literally Psalms Mm. 23 had Mm. to like, be like, you have had this memorized since you were a little girl. You're actually teaching on this, but am I truly your shepherd? Mm. Like, Like, are you not in, like, need because I give you what, like, am I your protector? Am I your provider? And so that psalm is such a beautiful thing to me now. And when I'm finding myself starting to drift like that sheep, I'm like, all right, get Mm. your rod and your staff and pull me right back Mm. in, Lord. Because, I mean, he had to teach me through some some pretty big loss Mm -hmm. that, hey, you're trying to do this on your own and I need you to be dependent on me. Mm -hmm. And so like, like you were talking about with your friend, I will forever look on 2023 and that season of life just as a sweet dependency and intimacy with Christ and Mm -hmm. with our heavenly father, because he was like, your dad is a good man, Mm. but he's not a perfect father, Mm -hmm. but I am. And Mm -hmm. I will actually provide the things that you Mm -hmm. need. And I will do it in my perfect way. That doesn't just give you your need, but actually changes your heart and helps you to trust me more. And Mm -hmm. so that has just been like, I will like, it will forever be a time that I will look back and just be like, Ah, oh, you are, you're so good. Mm-hmm. And you are exactly everything mm-hmm. I need. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's so good. Yeah. I think, um, the, my first thought is developing a pretty severe anxiety disorder in, um, college mm. and, uh, I really could point to, you can almost point to any hard thing in life Mm -hmm. and go, yes, this is the way that God brought me back to him. Like, I don't know that I've experienced any hard thing that God didn't Mm -hmm. ultimately use to bring me back to him. Um, But quick disclaimer on that too. We are not saying that everything bad that happens to you is done right. out of that. We live in a broken world. Correct. The yeah. Lord does yeah. redeem and use all the hard things. Yeah. Yeah. But some things um, he does intentionally send us. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think the the scripture that God gave me during that time, because really in college, like I had come into this um this place of confidence in who I was in Jesus and, and like my own abilities or Mm -hmm. gifts or whatever. I was like, I'm pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm good at friendships. I've got this great 
really attractive boyfriend mm. who loves Jesus mm. and I'm working three jobs and I'm taking 19 <laughs> credits and I can do it all. Yeah. And then I like, I get this anxiety disorder and I don't even know what anxiety is because at that time nobody talks about it. And it drives me to God like nothing ever mm -hmm. has before. Yeah. And the scripture that he gave me during that time that just was my mantra was second Corinthians 12, right? And my, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And what, what he gave me actually comes before that, that it says, um, so that you would not become conceited. Mm. This is why I gave you these thorns. So you wouldn't become conceited. And it was like, I read that anew in that season of life and went, oh, I had become conceited. Mm -hmm. I thought I could do it on my own. Mm -hmm. And my anxiety brought me back to a place of utter, like, I 100% cannot do mm -hmm. this apart from you. Like it, even just a, a daily life thing, not just like ministry mm -hmm. or uh, enduring a hardship, but like going to class, I couldn't do apart from the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's my first on that. That's awesome. Those are great examples. Thanks. And then the truth is that when those things happen to us, we still have a choice, right? Israel mm -hmm. still had a choice. God gave them all those opportunities. Israel still said, no, thanks. Mm -hmm. Right. And we know that there's people in our lives who have experienced hardship and suffering that God maybe designed or intended to bring them back. And they've said, Mm -hmm. No, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or I don't want to worship or serve a God who would allow something like this to yeah. happen. So there is still, and that's kind of the first, the first piece of what God's trying to get Israel to do through Amos is what he says, simply seek the Lord. Like this is your last chance, your last ditch effort. Seek me, turn to me. And so if you, Mike, encouragement for the people who are going to hear the sermon is first and foremost, if these kinds of things are happening in your life. Seek the Lord. Like you have to repent, have your heart changed by God. Um, so sit in that and go there if that's what if that's what's happening to you. Or you feel like you haven't turned, you haven't repented of of things. Um, and then the kind of second half of what God calls the Israelites to do is, He says, hate evil love what is good and seek justice. And so we really spend, hopefully I'll be able to spend, you know, a good amount of time in the sermon. This is on Thursday. You will have already heard the sermon by the time you listen to this probably, but on what does it look like to practice justice, to establish justice, to hate evil and love what is good. So um, there is in run through just had, we had a lot of brainstorming, tons of ideas and <laughs> options and stuff. Um, but talk a little bit about what you think, like when you read Amos and you um, see the injustices and then you think, okay, what does this look like in my life in 2024 in Topeka, Kansas? What does it look like for me to be a part of this? What comes to your mind? Like what, what do you, what swirls? Thoughts? <laughs> Lots of swirls. <laughs> that so happen. many swirls. Mm -hmm. Um... Well, I think that first when I, when I read this, this is, this is always my dilemma, um, with books like Amos passages like this, that call us call really are a strong call to action. Mm -hmm. Um, I immediately feel this like drive and desire to get in the game and mm -hmm. like take action. Go and then something. also this like terrified anxiety of what is this going to cost, um, to do this. And also I can't fix the world. Like the poor will always be with us. I cannot carry the problems of the world. And if I get in the game, I'm going to feel like I need to. Um, and that feels so overwhelming and hard. And so I, I always think of, um, mother Teresa just saying like, put your drop in the bucket. You know, it's, it's one more drop than was there before. You don't have to fill the whole bucket. That's not your job. God's calling all of us to this. And if we all put our drop in the bucket, mm. um, change will happen. Mm. So that's the first thing I have to start at is like, Slow what's, down. what's my drop in the bucket? Yeah. Um, where can I start? And then too, like what Amos calls us to is not just take action and, and act justly and, mm. and get in the game, but, but align your heart with God's heart. And so I think we have to start with like 
knowing God's heart and aligning our hearts with his so that we can hear his voice when he says, this is something I'm calling you to take action on. And um, we have the right perspective of the people he's calling us to, to care for and serve. And so it starts with an alignment of our hearts to God's. Um, and then that, that action, the obedience has to follow. So for me, for us, the Lord um, called us into the world of foster care. And when we moved here, it was like a fresh slate for me, right? I didn't know anybody. I didn't have friends. I wasn't working. I just had this um, three-year-old at home and I had a lot of time. So I connected with Carol Denton Mm -hmm. and I just was like, whatever you're doing, I'm going to do it with you. And I just got to like dip my hand into all these different ministries with her, which was so cool. And so that's what I would tell people too to start with is just like, our church has so many opportunities to get involved in injustice right here in Topeka. It just takes like an email or a commitment, which I know everyone mm. is so scared of commitment, but like committing to doing something. Um, and then it does, it takes a little courage, right? Um, I'm talking way too much to get to my point that like, the Lord kind of narrowed our our call and our focus to the fostering world um, here in Topeka. And now that we're in it, we are seeing the need in front of us like over and over and over again. So much so that um, you you can't ignore it. You can't turn a blind eye to it because we're in it. We've, we've put ourselves in the way of it. Um, and so that right now is, is the call um, to justice for us or for me. Yeah. Um, just even as you were, hitting just like first, just seeking him. Like, I think that has been the biggest part is when I am a in living out of just the overflow of just my relationship with him and I'm seeking him and I'm seeing who he is in scripture and I'm seeing that just shown again and again, even in my own life and those lives around me. Like, I want to be about what he's about and I want to love people Mm -hmm. the way he loves people and Mm -hmm. I want to see people the way he sees people. And so, um, yeah, I think one, I had parents who came to Christ in their 20s as a young family with toddlers, and God gave their heart a heart for the marginalized, those who are in need. And it has been modeled time and time again throughout our childhood and just opportunities to see that. But my heart breaks for those who have nowhere to belong. Mm or who are overlooked Mm -hmm. or like set aside because it doesn't seem like they have anything to offer. And so, um, honestly, even as we're talking through this, it's been really hard for me to figure out, okay, so what does that look like now? Because within student ministry on a Wednesday night, my, I love our kiddos and I would be pouring into just like our core base and our leaders but my heart was for those kids that struggled to fit in Mm -hmm. or who were off by themselves because of dealing with different things like gender identity issues or coming from hard home lives and they're there, but they don't even know Mm -hmm. who God is and they're dealing with so much other stuff at home. And so that has been really hard in the last few months. I've just, that, those, that is what my heart gravitated mm. to in teaching or doing ministry is those, those ones that are just on the margin, but like people don't, it, there's not a draw to them, but like mm. I, and so for me, it's kind of like, okay, so what does that look like now in mm-hmm. this role? And so um, just those who have feel kind of written off, mm. they don't feel like belonging mm. and, coming from somewhere where it's like a huge family and closeness. I'm like, no, I want everybody Mm -hmm. to feel that Mm -hmm. and to feel part of things. And so Mm -hmm. like, who are those people, Lord, give me eyes to see those ones that everybody else is choosing not Mm -hmm. to see or just ignoring. Yeah, Yeah. that's good. I mean, a a helpful reminder that um, justice is a loaded term. And so often with justice, we think about like righting wrongs that are out there, but a piece of justice ministry is obviously what you're saying, like seeing the marginalized or the people who are left out and just helping them. And maybe that doesn't fit under some people's thoughts about justice, but that absolutely fits under the biblical kind of idea of justice. So that's a 
uh, beautiful picture and mm-hmm. just, you know, from knowing who you are, mm-hmm. so obvious that that's your heart, mm-hmm. right? And you have shown that in so many different iterations of your life with different <laughs> people of all different ages and stages mm-hmm. as well. That's just mm-hmm. who you are. So it comes out. Um, one of the convicting things and run through was I think the closest one to one from like who, who <clears throat> excuse me, who God's calling out in Amos to our modern day is like business leaders, mm-hmm. um, people who employ and pay mm-hmm. other people, mm-hmm. um, or as, as Brody talked about too, like people who own, own house, rental properties, all that mm-hmm. stuff, landlords. So, um, he had a great, Brody had a great question, which was, um, we need to ask ourselves like when we're gaining wealth, oh, at whose expense mm-hmm. are we gaining it? And I just thought, oof, that's so good mm-hmm. to think about. Even in my, like, you know, we're in ministry, we don't make a ton, but like I see the social media reels about like passive income and get a house and then rent it out and then you can get another house and like mm-hmm. the idea of like bigger and better and growing your wealth. Um, and there is a housing affordability crisis in mm-hmm. Topeka, right? Mm-hmm. It's been brought up at uh, numerous city councils and a jump for years now that there's a lack of that. And Brody's Brody's question of like, is there a lack of that because we have a bunch of people who are buying up homes to get more wealthy and charge, they charge higher rent and, mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff. So it just is, it has me swirling mm-hmm. about the like, okay, if I am pursuing wealth for stability, for future, for kids' college educations, any reasons I would do that uh, on whose back, like, am I standing mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. get that? And so um, when I preach this in a couple of days, I probably will call out or, like, invite business leaders and landlords and people to think about, okay, how what system are you creating for and people who are on the fringes, on the margins, or who have had oh, terrible stuff happen to them. So that's kind of a macro view of like, yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's a big piece of Amos. Mm-hmm. And then you guys hit on the more personal views, the foster care and the marginalized, the outsiders. Um, anything else that you think of when you're thinking about like, what's a good practical way for people listening to this to think about what justice could look like for in their lives? Well, I think it goes back to we have a lot of families that are listening. Mm-hmm. And even if it's grandparents, how can you create opportunities for your grandkids or for your own children or if your aunts and uncles? Like creating spaces just to um, help our younger generation to see that there are needs. Because mm-hmm. I know yeah. Lee and the run through one things you talked about was like we need to put ourselves mm-hmm. In In the the way way. of need, like we need to be able to step out of our comfort in things where we can see it. And so as a kid who grew up every fourth Saturday, we went to Kansas City to um, basically like. Why am I uh, the Topeka Topeka Rescue Rescue Mission? Mission. We had in inner city Kansas City, a same kind of place. And so my parents would go and they would take teenagers and then load up our van of all the Weatherford kids and we would go feed homeless people after my dad would give a teaching. And, um, um, I mean, I don't even know how many family functions we've had where there's a gal that has just come out of prison that mama is mentoring, like, or my sisters have been mentoring that we have just welcomed people into that space. And so, I mean, it's just, how do we create things. I know there are families that like on Thanksgiving, make it Mm -hmm. a tradition to go do a serve a turkey meal or go do. So what are just practical Mm -hmm. ways that Mm -hmm. we can, um, I know there's families that work together and think through what are care packages that you could have. So if you see a homeless person that has like water and protein and different things. So what are just some different ways that you can as a family see need, but then as a former teacher, I think helping kids see like, there are kids in your students' classrooms that are really struggling at home and we don't know what those home lives are like. And so how can we be a blessing to those families? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And maybe you're not taking your kids into their spaces, but what what if you welcome those families into yours to love on them or to mm-hmm. meet needs that way? So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think too, like a really practical, um, maybe more everyday thing that we can take stock of is like, being a responsible shopper, mm. um, which can be really c- kind of complex to dive into. Yeah. Um, and then also just like 
if you pay your cleaning lady, are you paying her well? Mm. Like, or are you like, oh, I'm getting a great deal because I'm paying her. I got it. I got someone who doesn't charge that much. Mm -hmm. Like, um, mm -hmm. if you're tipping the waitress, mm -hmm. like, are you tipping appropriately? Because that might be a single mama working three jobs trying to provide and like, mm -hmm she didn't bring you your water fast. You know, just those things mm -hmm. that you're like, you, you can, mm -hmm. um, don't withhold good when you have the power, um, to, to give it out. So that's just a couple of small thoughts on how we can do that. Yeah. Those are great small thoughts. I, I would say too, if you're like sitting there and you're like, man, I just don't know. Uh, Brody was like, man, send people to me, please. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. give yeah. His his emails on the website, you know, Jeremy's too, but like he would love to plug you in. Love Topeka has a ton of opportunities each mm -hmm. month. Mm -hmm. um, uh, outreach is going to be doing something new here in like three or four months too. That's going to be a big kind of monthly event for the, I don't know if I was supposed to say that, but anyway, um, <laughs> so reach out. We have so many partnerships yeah. and, and easy on roads. I do, I do just like the idea of like, man, if you if you feel like you are doing what Israel which was, was doing, which was ignoring the needy, like if you're going, if you don't ever see needy people, if you're never exposed to mm -hmm. people who are in hardship, then just take the first step to exposing yourself to the other half mm -hmm. of the world, if you would. But yeah. like, yeah, whether it's through TR and rescue mission, serving meals or um, foster care, or any of those possibilities, yeah. like, yeah, like you said, put yourself in the way of that stuff. Um, and I have a, I'm going to end with a, with my sermon, I'm hoping to end with a quote from, from John Piper, but it was amazing. Um, the timing I, I was reading the sermon he gave on Amos and it ended with this political, kind of a political statement, like America will continue to be a free nation. Um, not because of, and he said basically like the laws, but it will only continue to be free as long as Christians in the church love and fight for the justice of the people around them. And he was closing his, his sermon to Amos. And I was like, wow, this is poignant timing. I wonder mm -hmm. when he wrote this. And it was like, I looked at the top and it was like 1982. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, okay, wow. well, this is a timeless truth. I guess yeah. we, we continue to like, look at politics and obviously that's coming up soon as our answer to some of these problems and in reality we need to remember like it is on us like mm -hmm. god has given mm -hmm. us everything we need to do this in our communities and in our church so just a reminder of that so uh anything else you guys want to close with final thoughts no okay Good. lee will you pray over uh the people who'll be listening to this sure. in community Love groups you. thanks uh, Lord, thank you that you are a patient and gracious and faithful God, that even when we wander away and ignore you and um, our worship is really unacceptable at times, mm -hmm. Lord, that you take us back again and again and again, and that you, um, that you use um, all sorts of things in our lives, um, Lord, for our good to bring us back to you. Um God, I, I thank you that you see the unseen mm. and that you are a God of justice and you care about the needy and the poor and that you allow us to be a part of bringing your kingdom to earth, Lord. Um, I pray for the people who are listening um, or who heard the sermon this weekend, Lord, who um, feel their hearts stirred up and they uh, want to seek you. They want to align their hearts to you. They want uh, to get in the game and um, and fight for justice alongside of you. God, would you give them an, an on-ramp? Would you give us eyes to see the people around us mm -hmm. who are in need? Would you um, give us hearts that are aligned with yours? And I just pray that there would be an explosion at Fellowship Bible Church of um, people really working uh, to be your hands and feet uh, in Topeka. Um, God, let us be a part of it. Um, call us into it. And um, I just pray for community groups um, right now as they discuss, Lord, would you move hearts and, um, and let us be a part of your work in jesus name amen amen thanks lee thanks amy for being here thank you church family for joining us on this episode of the deeper podcast uh, we look forward to seeing you all next time